Okay, so without further ado, allow me now to invite our trusted and well-respected Mr. David Ellis of Starcom Network to uh, lead us through panel discussion. Mr. Ellis. Good morning and thank you all. Uh, I'm going to start with Charles Herbert to get his overview of the budget. Now, Charles uh, won a Barbados Exhibition Scholarship in 1974. In 78, he attained uh, BSc in Math with first class honors from Edinburgh University. And on returning home, he taught mathematics at Harrison College, where he went to school for two years before joining the Barbados Mutual as a trainee actuary. Uh, he worked, he left the Mutual in 1994 to go into actuarial consulting work. In 1996, he established a branch of Eckle Limited in Barbados, where he still works as one of the four local principals. In 2012, he joined the Board of Goddard Enterprises, and in 2013 was elected chairman, a post which he still holds. In 2017, Charles was appointed to the Board of the Barbados Private Sector Association, and in August, elected chairman of post which he currently holds, Charles Herbert. Thank you. The opening statement that I'm going to make is one which has been crafted by the entire private sector associations, and it's meant to be a statement or position, a general position that we all take. The Minister of Finance painted a pretty accurate picture of the current dire state of Barbados' government finances and the challenges facing the economy. For the first time, he admitted that the government debt was 145% of GDP, plus contingent debt of 12%, plus undisclosed government payables, which include VAT refunds, tax refunds, and trade payables. He was right that the persistent debt has made the fiscal deficit public enemy number one. It threatening our FX pay and reserves, the ability to borrow on the international market on reasonable terms, and our competitive position in, world, which, in the world, which influences our ability to grow. However, we disagree with the Minister of Finance on the measures that he is proposing to address the situation. He has chosen to close the deficit initially, essentially by increasing revenue by $320 million, rather than reducing government spending where he proposed only unspecified cuts of $82 million. I'm not even going to mention the smoke and mirrors about the debt reduction. We therefore, we believe that this is wrong and will have a dis be disastrous for the economy because while it does address the deficit, it has the entirely wrong effect on the cost of doing business in Barbados and also on our competitive position in the world and our ability to grow in the medium term. We believe that these measures will depress economic, economic activity due to a sharp rise in prices of 10 to 13 percent. The GDP will fall, making the debt as a percentage of GDP rise and more difficult to service and it will make the estimates of revenue that he has given optimistic, to say the least. Economic stability, far less growth, will be severely threatened. We call this pain with no gain. However, deficit reduction focused on expenditure reduction as we recommended, while it would have caused similar short-term pain would have been designed to make Barbados less expensive and more competitive and encourage growth and stability. Do not for one minute believe that our recommendations did not have a social conscience and that we did not recommend either VAP moving to 22% or a removal of school meals. These are alternative facts. <laughs> aimed at scare tactics of telling the, persuading the population that what the wicked private sector would have done is in fact much worse than the regressive tax system that we now see, which is in fact going to bear far more heavily on the poorer members of our society than it will on the more better off members of our society. The Minister is right that Barbados needs to develop a credible fiscal framework 
before going to the IMF. Work on this has been called for many months ago, but now needs to be embarked on in haste over the summer months. The minister laid out a plan with some very long names, which I can't remember, of, the, of what would happen over these summer months. While I hope and we think that these things should come to pass, it is very difficult for us to be confident. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Dr. Winston Moore is Professor of Economics and Head of the Department of Economics at the University of the West Indies, Cave Hill Campus. Prior to this, he held the position of Senior Economist at the Central Bank of Barbados. His recent research has examined the issues surrounding the green economy, private sector development, as well as the economic impact of climate change on tourism. Dr. Moore has published more than 80 peer-reviewed papers, books, and book chapters. He holds a PhD in economics from the University of Surrey, a master's a MSc in economics from the University of Warwick, and a BSc in economics from the University of the West Indies Cave Hill. Dr. Winston Moore, your overview. One thing that um, David left out from that um, overview of my accomplishments, I'm also really bad at playing tennis as well. So <laughs> you should also include that in the next time. Um, no, I'm a really nice person. So I usually start my reviews of any paper or of any document with the strengths and opportunities. Uh, so and you can tell that I'm a nice person because of the smile, right? Uh, so, the same thing would happen this morning. I'm probably going to focus a lot more on the strengths and opportunities for, of the document. And then, um, a little bit later on this morning, I'll get into a couple of the weaknesses and some of the things that were a little bit incorrectly presented um, in the document as well. Uh, so, first of all, the, the position of the uh, Barbados economy was fairly well set up. It sort of indicates that we are in a very significant and dire position. You have a debt to GDP ratio of 144% of GDP. And even more pressing than that, your uh, interest expense as a proportion of your revenue or as your income uh, is around 20 to 30%. So essentially, if you are an individual, your, um, your interest on your mortgage is taking up 20% of your monthly income. Uh, for most individuals, for most bankers, you would say that is really not a sustainable position. So based on that, these recommendations come on the heels uh, of that particular position in Barbados. So looking at the strengths, it obviously means that we need to have some significant adjustment in the Barbados economy. And some of the, recommend, some of the uh, policy recommendations do um, bear that out in, in some way, even though I have um, some sort of conditionalities on that. The foreign exchange tax, uh, one of the benefits of that, and I think Eddie might like this, is that it might push Barbadians to focus a little bit more on local retailers um, rather than the online retailers because if you're getting this foreign exchange tax, rather than maybe overseas and you pay 2% in Miami, you might want to consider purchasing those items in Bridgetown or other local retailers as well. So one strength. Um, then also the national social responsibility levy. One of the things that we did in the 1990s is that we had this broad base, um, 7% cut in wages of government workers. Now, that is not feasible at the moment because it is not allowed by the Constitution. Um, but by increasing the national social responsibility levy from 2 to 10%, we've essentially cut wages and salaries of all Barbadians. Um, so we've essentially implemented a similar policy to what we implemented in the early 1990s. Again, uh, a fairly useful thing in terms of generating revenue, given that you are in a crisis. Uh, the other issue here is the debt um, reprofiling. Remember, I mentioned earlier that um, approximately 20 to 30 percent of interest was going of interest um, interest expense was accounted for about 20 to 30 percent of revenue. Um, the debt reprofiling is expected to um, change that ratio a little bit and push down the proportion of interest expenses going to of revenue that is accounted for by interest expenses. So again. Um, a fairly useful thing uh, in terms of the strengths of the document. Uh, then also the tax amnesty. Uh, we're hoping that or that could potentially bring more persons into the tax net, which is also potentially a fairly useful thing. 
Now the opportunities that could come out of this document for maybe some of the business persons in the room um, here today. Uh, some of the SOEs, it was announced in the document that some of the SOEs might be di divested. So this creates some opportunities for purchase and some further economic activity. So this might be something that you can take a look at and consider going forward in the future. Um, diesel, the tax on diesel um, compared to um, gasoline vehicles is now a lot lower. So if I was selling the um, vehicles, obviously I might want to switch my portfolio towards diesel vehicles. I have some real strong thoughts about this though, and I kind of let this one go before giving my negative comments about this, because we, we've always talked about Boris being a green economy, and this really doesn't help that goal in any way, because if you're switching the purchase of vehicles towards these very large vehicles that we see um, very all around the world, uh, that's not really a benefit in terms of pushing Barbados towards a green economy. You're still dependent on fossil fuels. What we should have seen is maybe a, a cross the board tax based on CO2 emissions. And if you're taxing based on CO2 emissions, then that might encourage people to maybe purchase um, hybrid vehicles and electric vehicles and maybe smaller vehicles rather than these large 4x4s that we see on the road at the moment. Sorry, I couldn't let that one go. Before. <laughs> I'm still trying to be positive. Uh, and then also consultancy opportunities. Uh, it was announced in the document that there was uh, opportunities that are going to be made available for to develop monitoring and performance-based systems for key social agencies, um, which receive transfers from government. So, if, for example, state-owned enterprises. Um, again, I, I'm, I, so that's the positive part. But I'm, I'm, I'm struggling here to understand whether or not we still have the National Productivity Council because the National Productivity Council does the same thing. So why would you need consultants to basically do the same thing that the Productivity Council is doing? But nevertheless, uh, consultancy opportunities are available. Uh, so I'll give you the strengths and opportunities and a little bit later on I'll delve into some of the weaknesses of, uh, of the document. Okay, thank you. So I've gone in the direction of trying to get an overview first and now we're going to get to some specific areas. Uh, beginning here with um, Donna Wellington from CIBC First Caribbean International Bank. Uh, she's been with this bank since uh, 2005 after working 15 years for Sajakor, Ernst & Young Caribbean and PwC in Barbados. At CIBC First Caribbean, she has progressed through various positions in the corporate and investment banking segment, culminating in her current position as the managing director, Barbados Operating Company. In this position, Donna has responsibility for revenue generation and regulatory affairs across all key segments of the banking operations of the Barbados operating company in eight countries, Barbados and seven countries in the OECS. A seasoned corporate banker with 28 years experience in the financial services sector, Donna also has a strong accounting background with a BSc in accounting from the University of the West Indies and she is a member of the Certified General Accountant Association registered under the Charter Professional Accountants Association of Canada, as well as a Master's Certificate in Financial Leadership from Schulich School of Business, New York University, sorry, York University in Canada. Donna Wellington. Thanks, David. Uh, I just want to mention a couple of things uh, generally first and then specifically about how banks and creditors would see uh, this budget. So when it came to just the general overview, uh, strategically, um, we understand that this needed to be a budget that appealed to the masses. It needed to be a budget that would allow for uh, electability. Um, unfortunately, however, um, it also basically demonstrated short-term pain and no long-term improvement. It was a one and done um, and no views of the future. Promises, however, of a homegrown program, which I'll speak to in a minute. So we, we did welcome the following. Uh, there was a promise of further consultation and I, I will mention the name of the document, uh, the Comprehensive National Fiscal, Economic, and Social Development Restructuring and Enhancement Program. 
I'm going to urge the government, however, to come up with a shorter acronym. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm glad to hear that there is a plan for a homegrown program, and that one is being prepared, and that potentially this could be used as a multi-year document to demonstrate sustainable adjustment. However, um, and, and it did say that it was going to cover boosting foreign exchange earnings, productive sector reform, competitiveness commission that would deal with the competitive action teams that have been set up um, and were the initiative of the private sector association, uh, a new national energy policy, fiscal consolidation and financial management and audits of the SOEs and an act to do so, an SOE reform for mergers and acquisitions, operational cons um, consolidation and divestment, and on that, I will say that uh, when we think of, of the Hilton, um, where we're sitting right now, uh, I would also like to um, strongly urge that there be transparency in the divestment and that it be offered to local uh, hoteliers and, and, and um, others who might be interested in the asset. It would be better for us if it were. Um, so just, just to put that little plug in there. Uh, that survey, that growth, stabilization and reduction through fiscal reforms and social sector reforms in critical areas such as healthcare and education. So that's a great idea um, and one that we certainly would welcome. Uh, there is need, as was mentioned, to even prepare uh, the, the, the country should we even have to go into an IMF program at some point in the future. We need to have a document that is the, the basis upon which we go. And this was mentioned by the Minister of Finance that if mm. you do have to go to them, it is most critical that you have your own document and you do not just give them uh, the pen. Uh, the, the, where, the, where the other measures are concerned, whilst the others will, will talk about uh, primarily the, the um, the other taxes, the one that obviously will impact the commercial banks the most is the 2% uh, foreign exchange uh, tax. Uh, this will impact the general public, of course, and will make everything more expensive because we are an import economy. But on top of that, the commercial banks will be tasked with uh, another financial institutions that, that are the sellers of foreign exchange will be tasked in tax collection, basically, and that is something that we're not currently set up to do, but we will have to make ourselves prepared to do so. Uh, there was no uh, focus on expenditure. Uh, there was promises of focus uh, through this document uh, that I can't, the acronym I can't tell you again, uh, but this needs to be demonstrated, well, there, there needs to be demonstration of two things, even if that document is being prepared. And that comes to what, especially as a creditor to the government, we would expect to see. And certain, certain, certainly, uh, dialogue by the social, dialogue with the social partnership and creditors and everybody else that are um, going to be impacted by the measures is absolutely critical. Um, not, not just uh, a situation where a document is shown to us, but that there is some consultation and, and there is conversation around it. And then uh, we, also, we actually have to see something happen this summer. Uh, this is something that we've been promised for a long time. Uh, where expenses are concerned, it has not been up to now, as, as was mentioned earlier. There's been no actual detail on how these expenses will be cut, and it's, a, it's, it's absolutely important that we understand it. It's a start uh, to say that they will be cut, but um, we've also heard this before. Uh, this document and the budget really would not have improved competitiveness of Barbados and or confidence uh, by the private sector in the measures on account of the fact that they're not sustainable. One of the things that was uh, interesting to me at least was that none of the revenue measures were time bound. They should have been. Uh, if, if we're going to have a 2% tax on foreign exchange, how long is that going to be for? Um, there have been other measures in budgets past that, that were time-bound and, and, and this one should have, we, don't, we should at least have had some sense of that. So no real 
sense of a sustainable plan yet. Um, and I will be very interested in what the responses are of the international markets, the rating agencies, and the Article 4 commentary that will come at some point uh, in our calendar year about this budget, um, especially when it has to do with the plans for debt and, and how interest costs, as was mentioned, is going to be reduced. Thank you. Thank you very much. Roseanne Myers is the General Manager of Atlantis Submarines Barbados and was appointed the Chairman of the Barbados Hotel and Tourism Association in June last year. She is the first Direct Tourism Services member of a National Tourism Association to hold that post in the Caribbean. She's a recipient of a Bachelor of Science Honours Degree in Chemistry and Biochemistry and has a Master's of Science in Tourism and Hospitality with Distinction. She has over 35 years in senior management experience in the manufacturing and tourism sectors. Roseanne Myers. Thank you, David. <laughs> um, I think when we look at the impact of the budget on the tourism sector, and that is the, or the only um, parts of the budget that I will focus on, um, there was a statement that set up the context in which I believe the measures were intended not to heavily impact on the tourism sector. There was a statement that says, we also felt that a rush standardization of the VAT rate across all valuables or valuable sectors, including hotel accommodation and direct tourism services, as recommended by some private sector groups, um, would likely cause short-term um, this location in the tourism sector, which is struggling from the negative effects of the reduced value of the pound from a, the, the lucrative United Kingdom market, as well as harm the price competitiveness um, and the issues that we're seeing because of the rising value of the U.S. dollar. And I would add the, the uncertainty um, caused now by, by the, the statements sometimes coming out of the U.S. So it basically took note of the fact that we are in a difficult situation from a tourism perspective. We have fought gallantly, but even when you look today um, to Theresa May's, uh, Prime Minister Theresa May's lead seems to have narrowed and that has caused a drop, further drop in the pound. So we are in a very fluid situation with respect to tourism. And there was an attempt um, to recognize that and therefore not change the seven and a half fat rate, which I do believe that the, the, the social partnership in the working group said that that should be protected. So it's not fair to say that there was an across the board attempt to raise the tourism um, uh, VAT. There was, a, there was certainly an understanding that this would not be the time to look at um, putting direct costs on the tourism sector. So we really appreciate that. Um, I have to say though, that the 7.5% that we are seeing for the accommodation sector and for a very small number of the direct tourism services um, really harks back to the fact that we have still not implemented fully the intended um, incentives on the tourism sector from about three, four budgets ago. So am I a believer that everything that is said here is going to happen? Um, I, I am really hopeful that it will, but our experience has not been good. We are still running around trying to get full access to the concessions and the incentives that were given on the food and beverages. And people would have heard me time and time again talk about 49 items. Every day I wake up, I'm looking for 49 items. Additionally, that we have submitted to this list of of, 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 of incentives that were supposed to be given to drive the cost of the industry down. So we have not changed the seven and a half, but what we've in fact done is to still add costs to the sector. Um, the legislations for the National Social Responsibility Levy, increasing from two to 10%, will have a direct impact on the cost of the tourism sector. Because as I've said, we've not seen a full rollout of the, of the duty-free status, certainly on the food and beverage side, and there are only a few um, businesses that will basically fall on the, the legislation that makes the tourism 
um, that particular tourism business exempt from the NRSL. Um, so a number of us in the sector, um, small businesses, have in fact been, been paying the NRSL. Um, because it's not specifically stated, sometimes it's hard to, 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 to see it. But at 10%, we definitely will see an increase in the cost. If that wasn't intended for the industry across the board, then that is something that would need to be addressed. But as it stands right now, in terms of competitiveness, it will in fact drive our costs up for locally manufactured goods and for everything that we import. And I think that even though the will is there for us to look at serious import substitution um, in terms of the, the, the things that we have to bring in now um, and the things that we could possibly grow locally, we are not there yet. We are not there yet, so we will see an increase. Um, so if you look at what will happen and where you have um, a foreign currency account and you don't necessarily have to go on the market and buy foreign currency, you will not necessarily suffer the 2% on every transaction, but the medium and small businesses in the tourism sector, we have to remember the tourism sector is not only accommodation, it's all the attractions, it's the car rentals, it's all the catamaran companies, and so on, that if you do not have a foreign currency account, you're going to pay the 2% on your transactions. Um, for a lot of the stuff that we need to run, you can't run a boat and maintain it with anything that's manufactured locally in terms of parts for your engines and so on, as an example. So you're bringing in, you're paying the 2%, you are going to pay the duty because you don't have duty free, you're going to pay the 10% in, in RSL, and then you're going to add the 17 and a half VAT on top of that. The truth is the complexity of figuring out what the impacts are just to explain to anyone who is a foreign investor, it looks like doing business in Barbados just got a little bit more complicated. Now, I do want to say that the tourism sector really feels we have a responsibility to share in the pain, and we know there had to be pain because we had a situation where our fiscal deficit ran amok and we had to get it in order. We've done it in one year. And that is where the pain that we're seeing is, obviously, but there's no question it will bring additional costs. So that 2% charge um, is one that will be um, of concern, and the compounded effect of the 10% NRSL, it will not end up in your p &L as 10%. There's no question about that, because the importer, they put their margins on, then they add the 10%, then you have the VAT, so the, there will be a cumulative effect on not only businesses in tourism, but all of the uh, people working and operating um, in, across Barbados, and certainly for individuals. The excise tax on gas and diesel increased 30-odd um, percent will have an impact on the tourism sector, because transportation is a big factor in the tourism sector. If you're running in the cruise sector or um, hotels, everybody needs to be ferried around. So there will be an impact there. If you're running a boat with diesel, there will be an impact there. The bigger question, though, is we're in a, a scenario where we're still trying to pay our bills, and we're still trying to drive foreign um, currency and foreign exchange earnings. Will this budget actually dull the impact of any um, potential increased activity? Will it see a contraction in spending? Will it stimulate economic activity? I don't think that that's like, likely to happen. Um, and the, the fact that we're saying that the foreign currency, um, the 2%, is a deterrent for persons accessing foreign currency, the truth is if you are in a business where you require foreign currency um, to import stuff, to earn foreign currency, it is actually a deterrent to doing business. So if it is intended for people who are um, as a deterrent for people who are in a very discretionary way buying luxury items on the internet and so on, it might be very good um, a deterrent. But if you're in the business where you need to spend that foreign exchange, it actually makes doing business a little bit more difficult. I just wanted to touch quickly on two other uh, points, the sale of the Hilton. Um, the Hilton obviously is a brand near and dear to our hearts. We are hopeful that when we talk about the sale of the asset, 
you're talking about the sale of the asset and the brand remains. And I don't want to make the assumption, and my hope is that based on the contractual arrangements, I don't know the details, that the brand of the hotel, Hilton, does not leave our shores. Um, and I think that that is an important clarification because we have markets, we have two operators out there contracting every day that we, won't, we don't want to put any uncertainty into the market if we don't need to. So it, if, if the brand Hilton is not affected in any way and the asset is sold, we'll retain that Hilton management contract. We need to put that out there very early and certainly my hope that that is the situation. I want to join um, Donna in saying that it would be brilliant because Barbadian companies can access foreign exchange, that a Barbadian investor can take part in the sale of the Hilton, and I want to go further. This might be a brilliant opportunity for us to carve off 10, 20 percent, to put on the open market for local Barbadians who have a vested interest in the tourism sector to become not only employees and workers, but stakeholders and owners. And if we lose that opportunity, it would be um, a kind of a lost opportunity, especially in this market where there is a lot of liquidity. Give us a chance. I would like personally, and I'm sure a lot of you, to own a little piece of the Hilton. Um, and, and, and I'm told that the banks can facilitate, and Donnie can tell me, <laughs> in foreign currency, in foreign currency, so give us a chance, put it on the open market, let us bid our way through, and if, with all the money that we Barbadians have sitting in the bank, we can take a little bit and buy a handful of shares and have a stake and say we our owners, we are not only workers in the industry, I think it will do a lot for us. So I will stop there. Thank you very much. And Oliver Jordan is the government and public sector leader for PwC in the Caribbean and also a head of advisory services for the East Caribbean firm. He leads teams of multidisciplinary professionals in the delivery of the firm's advisory services to governments and private sector clients in Barbados and across the Eastern Caribbean. Oliver is a member of the Canadian Institute of Chartered Accountants, a fellow of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Barbados, and a certified fraud examiner. He's also a licensed trustee under the Barbados Bankruptcy and Insolvency Act. He is currently on the Council of the Barbados Chamber of Commerce and Industry and is chairman of the Barbados chapter of CPA Canada Chartered Professional Accountants. He's also a past president of the Barbados Bankers Association. Oliver Jordan. Thank you, David. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, before giving my remarks on the Barbados budget, I thought I'd spend a few minutes looking at the regional context. As you know, since 2008, uh, many of the regional economies have been significantly challenged and I have to go through various months of restructuring. We see in some countries such as Jamaica and Grenada go into IMF programs. Um, the Jamaica program is actually quite successful. We see an increase in multilateral funding from the World Bank, the CDB, and, and, and also the IADB. And many countries have taken advantage of the concessional funding from those agencies. We have seen the introduction of the citizenship, citizenship by investment program, particularly in some of the countries in the Eastern Caribbean. So clearly, you know, there's been a lot of effort that to restructure the economies. In fact, uh, just last week, I was in Turks and Caicos attending the CDB's annual meeting, and there was a presentation from Dr. Daniel Liederman of the World Bank who talked about the fact that there's need for bold transformational change, particularly in the small open economies of the Eastern Caribbean. So I think clearly the message is there that we need to be bold and transformational, and the question is, has this budget achieved that? We've had, obviously had the various initiatives over the last few years, the medium-term fiscal plan, which had mixed success. But the reality is, we are sure we'd all agree, that we haven't had any real restructuring of the Barbados economy. In his remarks last night, the minister did note that there is a bit of a balance between the social side and the fiscal side. And I think that's a challenge that we all face in crafting an appropriate response. Uh, clearly, as a country, we use a certain amount of services. But the reality is that we, we can no longer afford to pay for some of those services. So the question is, do we reduce those services or do we increase the user fees? And, and that's a debate that I guess we'll all continue to have. 
In terms of the budget itself, I'll just focus on a few areas. Um, definitely would support the notion of the, the divestment and giving Barbados an opportunity to participate. I would like to see uh, a discussion on divestment beyond the Hilton. I think there's certainly a number of other assets that we can look at, and certainly the airport comes to mind, uh, the seaport. But again, I think that any kind of divestment should, again, give Barbados an opportunity to be one part of it. I know over the years, divestment has become a bit of a bad word, and there's a feeling that we're selling out to foreigners, but as Rosanne just said, there should be an opportunity for Barbados to participate. Uh, one area of concern for me in the budget, again, is not enough focus on the expenditure reduction. And there was a discussion of the 10% across the board, but I did feel that the, the minister could go a long way towards looking at some of the structural issues in the economy. Now, we did, he did allude to the fact that it would be further consultation, but my sense is that that consultation has already happened, and I felt that we should already be focused on dealing with the expenditure side of things right now. The other concern, I think, when we take a step back from the budget is that while the focus is on the immediate issues in terms of the deficit and finance and farm reserves, um, my sense was that there wasn't enough focus on how we actually grow the economy. So yes, we fix the short-term issues, but are we really laying the foundation for future growth in the economy? I think that, for me, is the biggest gap in the budget. Uh, again, as part of the discussion over the next few months with these consultations, I guess we will get there, but for me, I think the reality is that we need to deal with these issues now, and I'm not sure how much further another six months or 12 months of consultation will achieve. So I think that's something that we really need to think about a bit more. Um, then finally, again, in terms of the state-owned agencies, there's been a lot of discussion about the state-owned agencies. Uh, I think there's definitely a need for reform, and some of the initiatives announced by the minister were appropriate. But I think my message would be that we need to get moving on those rather quickly. Um, we all know the issues in the agencies and the challenges that they face, and I think you know, to spend another year talking about it is not going to get us where we need to get to. Thank you. I want to come to those of you who are in the audience to get your thoughts and your questions, but before I do, I wouldn't want to miss the opportunity of hearing the President of the Chamber, Eddie Abed. What are your thoughts? Thank you uh, again, and good morning again to everybody. Um, first of all, I think we need to commend the Minister of Finance for being courageous to not only point the picture or paint the picture of how, how uh, what, what a dire need we are in, uh, in terms of the economy and in terms of our foreign exchange reserves. And to try to balance the budget in one year has been as I say, courageous. The sad part is that perhaps this conversation should have been had at least two or three years ago. We're trying to do too much in too short a time and it's going to be extremely painful. Um, I'm going to basically just echo some of the remarks that have been given already. We would have liked to have seen more of a balanced approach where the expense side was dealt with um, proportionately as the revenue side perhaps would have been dealt with. My concern is that this is not a short-term measure. This is here to stay. Because I just cannot see how, unless you systemically go after the expense side to drive it down, how we're going to be able to reduce the NSRL or reduce this uh, Commission on Foreign Exchange meaningfully in the future. I just can't see it. So to me, this is part of cost of doing business, which sadly will drive up um, the cost of, of the non-competitive cost in Barbados, because none of what has been done, none of the, these revenue-raising measures have been tied to productivity or competitiveness. None of this have been um, indexed to performance indicators where we can say that we know the ease of doing business is woefully poor, poor in Barbados, and we'd like to be able to set a target and say within the next three years, this is what we want to achieve. And by doing so, we recognize that the efficiencies will translate into productivity and competition, which ultimately will perhaps start driving down costs. We're not seeing that. Uh, we feel strongly that the approach should have been one where perhaps we look at use of fees. Those who enjoy services should pay something towards it. Um, perhaps some sort of means testing, um, definitely 
a situation of where we have state-run enterprises, those that are, are not performing should definitely be jettisoned and told that Jamaica and St. Lucia are in the process of selling off their state media houses currently, and neither of which are incurring losses to the tune of what ours is in Barbados. There's so many embedded assets in Barbados, and, and you mentioned the big ones, the seaport and the airport. My concern is about all the other structures that the BIDC owns. We've been told the situations that because its government is the landlord, tenants do not pay rent, and they know they can get away with it. It's time that we sell these assets off to Barbadians, access the, um, their deposits that they have, or maybe have, I, the last estimate, Donna will confirm this, is eight or nine billion dollars in, in uh, savings, and perhaps change the ownership on that. And there's several other areas that perhaps we can look at divesting opportunities to greater Barbadian shareholding. I think the important lesson here is that needs to be dialogue. No, there is not a monopoly on intelligence to one political party versus another. There is not a monopoly of ideas on the public sector side or on the private sector side. We're all Barbadians. We all need to swim in the water. And we all need to survive. So I think we need to continue the dialogue and that the programs, solutions, and, and for sure the direction for it should be charted by all of us. There needs to be a say so there's greater buying. Um, my immediate concern is there will be an increase in the cost of living. My immediate concern is that we expect that there will be a dampening of demand by consumers. Um, many of our companies, especially through the Chamber's membership, are extremely lean and I, it, there's absolutely no way we can absorb this. It's going to be passed on, and of course, we're all bracing for the fact that we know we're going into a very competitive back-to-school season, and then later in the year into um, into the very important Christmas season. So there's still far too much lack of clarity that we would like seen. Um, we'd like to know how a lot of this is going to be implemented, especially the NSRL. We, we're aware that the NSRL now will attract a VAT from locally manufactured goods. We're aware of that, but we're still not clear if we export, if the NSRL will be charged. Perhaps you've done an analysis on that. Based on the, the bill that we saw yesterday, it did not appear so. It appeared to be on, on local consumption. So not on export. Correct. OK. Well, that's a positive. And again, thank you for, for asking me the opportunity. We did see a few positives. We're very keen on the duty-free zones that are going to be set up. We think there's a tremendous amount of um, foreign exchange that's not getting into the, the above-ground legitimate uh, banking system, uh, and we would like to see that a lot of that is sapped up through the duty-free zones. We think it's going to be an important step, and it's an opportunity for local businesses to grow their, their footprint in, in the tourism area. I think we need just more opportunities there. So I'll leave it there and, and open the questions to the audience who I'm sure must be having tremendous concerns as well. I, I'm particularly keen to hear from somebody in the international financial sector. And I, the reason why I'm asking that is because in listening to the Minister of Finance yesterday, one of the points he made was the amount of revenue that has been lost in this particular sector over a period of time. And it really suggests to us that part of our struggle right now is because of those losses. The question is, where are we headed as it relates to the international financial sector? Last night, in a discussion on this matter, uh, one of the panelists said that there was a need to address this whole question of the IBCs, and he was talking about ring fencing and the extent to which we are now uh, fighting a battle uh, with other countries uh, as a result of our focus on IBCs. I see... Um, David, before you get there, can I just... Yes, say please. Uh, before um, Handy comes to the mic, um, the revenue that we have, we're collecting at the moment is actually higher than what we were collecting before the crisis. So revenue in Barbados is not the problem at all. We are, we are collecting more revenue now than we were before the crisis. What's the crisis? What's the problem then? Um, the problem is the expenditure, which I haven't stated as yet. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later on. But I'm sure Handy could talk about his industry. But we're collecting more revenue now than we were before the crisis. Henderson Holmes. Good morning, everyone. 
Uh, <laughs> thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, actually, we may be collecting more revenue, but certainly not for the international business sector. Um, we moved from a position where the national business sector in up to 2007, I was contributing about $350 million to the barbarous economy. Uh, it is in tax alone, so, right? But when now we're still making a contribution, I, I believe you know, of over a billion dollars to overall the economy. Now, how do you slump from $350 million down to under $100 million? There are a lot of reasons. Um, first of all, we lost some of our large tax paying businesses. In fact, people might not be aware of it, but after 2007, I think it was 2008, there's one company that left Barbados because of the changes in the Canadian tax law, the, 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 the um, availability of the exempt surplus treatment to uh, tax information exchange, countries that sign tax information exchange agreements with, with Canada. So if you have, a, say, oil and gas business in Barbados, a, a subsidiary here, that is really just under management. It doesn't employ anyone, but it's paying a lot of taxes. We had one that was paying $80 million in taxes. The year before it left, it was paying $80 million. And a few, about three or so, that were paying about $20 million, and then some lesser ones. So that is where the, 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 the impact on the tax came, is at that time. Um, why would you stay in Barbados and pay 2.5% tax? If you can go to Bermuda, because it's just a matter of overnight changing your manager of your company. It's not, you don't have to close down anywhere. It's not like gutters that you will put people out of work and that kind of thing. So you take it from one manager and take it to another manager. Now, um, the, the, the reality is that the international business sector, at one time Barbados was a leading, I would say, a leading international business center. We were third in, in line, in fact, in the, the hierarchy in terms of captive domiciles. Uh, in the 19, up to 1990 or 91 of the world. And the question is, haven't we taken the international business sector for granted? What have we done to ensure our position as a leading capital domicile? We're now about ninth or tenth or something like that. The reality is that if you look at how we promoted international business and what we have done in terms of maintaining our position in international business, we have grudgingly financed the promotion of international business. I mean, I, I, I don't have anything against tourism. Tourism is a very important sector. But whereas we, we, we find that successive governments have been willing to pump $110, $20 million into promoting um, tourism, they give gradually a $10 million or so for promoting international business. It's as though, you know, this is a sector, I believe there was an attitude once that this is a sector that was run by white expatriates and that they can take care of their business and you know it doesn't have the same kind of political profile from perhaps the position of getting votes as tourism. It's only employing over 4,500 people about, and um, we, 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 we probably aren't aware of the fact that those, of those 4,500, 90% are Barbadians and these are Barbadians, highly qualified Barbadians. And that the, the, because of them, the sector is able to pump large amounts of money into this economy, over a billion dollars. So we need to pay some attention to the ease of doing business in Barbados to attract more business. And we need to put more resources into promoting Barbados as a place for international business. That's the only way we're, we're going to get back to the days when the international business sector can make a big contribution. Just one question to you on that, though. Um, I hear in my ear somewhere somebody else who says, yet another example of the private sector being heavily dependent upon the, upon the government to drive a sector. How do you respond to that? Well, well, I don't know what you mean by dependent. I mean, if you look at, um, say, Bahamas, for example, and see what they do in terms of promoting the national business, they understand that the, the, the sector is making a substantial contribution to revenue, etc. And they plow back, this is a matter of policy, plowing back part of the revenue they earn from the sector into the economy. That's not a dependence on government. That is, that is the government doing what is necessary to drive the, to the economy. I mean, the, the former Prime Minister Owen Arthur is on record as, as speaking about the international business sector and its contribution to developing our middle class. Right? And, the, and, and, and as, as, as a contributor to the affluence that we see in Barbados. 
I mean, if you look around Barbados, the landscape of Barbados has been substantially changed by international business. I mean, a lot of the office complexes that we see, this modernity, this modernity of Barbados has been brought about mainly by international business. So it's not a matter of being dependent on government, it's a matter of government putting back some resources into, into building the economy. Thank you very much, Andy Holmes. There was one comment that was asked to make by Viva from last night. Is there's a lack of clarity on the two percent commission on foreign exchange? Um, there's one one interpretation which the banks had that it was two percent on FX trans transactions, and yet the the speech talked about two percent on purchases. So what is not clear? is if you are earner of foreign exchange, whether the 2% is only applied to your net purchases of foreign exchange, or whether foreign exchange that you earn and then use will not be subject to it. Um, if it is net, then it is not going to affect BIBA. If it is in fact on transactions, it would be disastrous for BIBA, and it would also be and for, well, I think it's going to hit tourism either way, but um, it's also going to be disastrous for manufacturers who export. We do have manufacturers that export 80 and 90 percent of what they produce. If in fact, although they are foreign exchange earning for the country, still have to spend an additional 2 percent buying their raw materials, this is going to make them less competitive. So that was just a statement that both the BMA and BIBA want to and, and I just want to say that um, the, the banks now have to do that work with um, our regulator and the government to understand how this thing works. So I don't want to be premature in saying exactly what the logistics are. We just need clarity. Can you identify yourself? Denise Montjuri Rogers, Rogman Holdings Incorporated. Good morning to the panel and to fellow business colleagues in the room. To my mind, a budget should not only address the short-term imperatives, but should also address, um, inspire confidence by putting proper fiscal, fiscal measures in place for the medium and the long-term. And the success of the budget, to my mind, is also on how it answers the critical questions that are before us this morning, like the gigantic fiscal deficit the stimulation of the Barbados economy, the balance of payments, the confidence by international investors and institutions, the impact of how we're going to stimulate our foreign reserves and also improve Barbados's competitiveness. So my question to you then therefore is, seeing that for the most part, I would say that the budget was a short-term budget, to what extent will the Barbados economy digress within the next 12 months, and if you agree that it will, how can we, the business community, brace ourselves and what mechanisms can we put in place to mitigate the fallout? Yeah, that's an interesting question. It, was, it, it is linked to one that I had in mind, which is, does it force business people to almost immediately look for a plan B? Winston Moore. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm not a business person whatsoever. But you had some what, what I will do cover is your question in terms of whether or not it would impact on the profile for Barbados going forward. And I've had this discussion with other economists this morning via, via WhatsApp, and I've been trying to think about how to, how to sort of put this discussion in terms of what I'm going to say next in the, uh, in the best possible way. And in the PwC report, what they say here is that the minister further stated that the discussions had commenced between the NAS and CB CBB, the two government entities own significant, uh, owning significant portions of government securities with the goal of a possible debt swap program. And I know everyone is very concerned about the SRL, um, the increase in the SRL, but um, a lot of my colleagues were also very concerned with this statement, with the idea of a possible debt swap. Uh, when international agencies see that term, debt swap, they normally think about a credit, a credit event. And one of the things that could possibly be the case, I know everyone is asking, is it possible that Barbara's external debt rate could go even lower? Um, but 
um, it is possible when you see this sort of language in the document. And that was my main concern, is it possible for, um, why would we put that sort of language in the document? And because it could have significant negative effects. Because this sort of, what they're talking about in terms of debt reprofiling, could be done in the natural course of doing business. There's no reason for you to say a, a possible debt swap. Uh, that is totally unnecessary uh, in terms of putting it in, in, in the document uh, because it could just make things uh, even worse. Um, so if you were a business person and you're holding government paper and the, the, and the external credit rating on the government paper falls even further, that has um, possible negative effects uh, on the economy. And remember I've covered all of the positives of the document already earlier. And the other thing as well, the document has stated that the, they're going to have a fiscal surplus in the upcoming year. And that is totally not the case unless they've changed the way of accounting. So the sale of um, the Hilton, you don't, you don't um, put the sale of the Hilton, the cash value, into your income statement because the government is doing a cruel accounting. So the, it's only the profit on the sale of the Hilton that goes into your income statement. So the cash from the sale of the Hilton goes into your cash flow statement. Am I right with all the accountants in the room? <laughs> <laughs> so this will have no impact on the fiscal deficit whatsoever. Um, when you increase the, um, the, the tax that has this cumulative effect, it leads to reduction in spending, and therefore reduction in value added tax, reduction in import duties, and it therefore also make worsens the fiscal deficit. So the policies that have been announced um, sort of puts Barbados' external credit rating um, at the forefront for our external credit rating agencies. It hasn't addressed the problem for our fiscal deficit at whatsoever. It actually, it actually doesn't make it worse. And it does not cover issues in terms of competitiveness. Um, my feeling about these proposals are very strong. I think the, the concept of having a statement of budgetary proposals divorced from the budget is, makes no sense. Um, because what we're left with, we're trying to shoehorn our policies into a budget that has already been announced earlier in the year. So is it the case these state-owned agencies, are they following the, um, the, budgets that, the budgetary proposals that came earlier in the year? Are they gonna use these new positive proposals? How are we gonna implement the tax revenue changes? Um, and if we collect more taxes, is this therefore going to change the budget available to these entities? We're starting new entities in terms of competitiveness commission. Why do we need another um, state-owned ent state entity when you have the National Productivity Council? Um, so I really think that it makes no sense whatsoever. Sorry, I use that term. Uh, it, it is not. Um, it's not in the best interest of the government. To, um, to have these policy proposals divorced from the budget. I think it's always best to have That's policy nice. proposals given in line with the budget. I don't think it is very, um, very useful thing to have these things divorced. And at the end of the day, these policy proposals are essentially then just a, a bit of political theater. They have no real effect going forward because the budgetary proposals are a statement or the estimates have already been laid in Parliament earlier this year. This statement by the government has very little impact on the fiscal situation going forward. All it is is a bit of political to there. So to the business people, uh, the question of whether this budget forces you to think of a plan B. David, ab absolutely right. I think that the political reality is that this budget will be passed by the end of the week. This is what we've got, despite whatever we say. Um, I think it is undisputed that the impact it's just on a it. It's just a statement. The estimates have been passed already. Yes, but this is the budget. No, this, this is just a statement. Go, go to <laughs> it the will mic. be passed at the end of the week. Oh, so a statement okay. will be passed by the end of the week then. <laughs> it's just a, sta it's just okay. a statement. Okay, let's move on. It has, it has <laughs> no real impact and whatsoever. These, these taxes will be in fact, it will be implemented by the end of the week or will be passed. Um, we do need a plan B. It is going to have a negative impact on the economy and we need to know how we're going to respond. Um, I don't know. It's, it's really all up to us. We're Bajans. We don't respond to anything. 
we just take it. <laughs> The, the one thing that we can do is we have been promised dialogue and a public discussion on patent expenses. You can say we asked for it, but we certainly now have been promised it very clearly. We need to demand that it happen. If this discussion really happens, if we really work hard over summer to develop a fiscal framework, the job that we haven't done for the last four years. We have been promised it if we demand it and if we get involved in it, these things would be good. They're probably the only thing they've held out to us as saying that we will be involved in. Um, we must be involved and we must demand that these things happen. And I really mean demand in a way that Bajans don't usually demand. These things are critical to our survival. If not, our medium term and our long term are exceedingly bleak. Rosa Myers. Thank you. I think that. Um, Is it? Well, it's supposed to be. Um, I think that the first thing that we have to do as businesses is to make sure that we understand the impacts of the different bits of what we expect would be legislation to allow the government to legally collect all the various um, taxes. So from a tourism perspective, there needs to be more clarity with the national responsibility, social responsibility levy in terms of who does, that, who does it impact and at what level and how can we look at the plan B that will say, how are we going to either pass these costs on or absorb the costs? Because we really are in the middle of a period where you would have already contracted for next year. And yes, it's not a change in VAT, but it will change your costs. And you need to look at how are you going to deal with that if you are, in fact, going to meet all your other obligations. Um, in looking at the document with respect to the areas that will be focused on, a couple of them did um, jump out, boosting foreign exchange earnings through cre creating even more attractive conditions of foreign direct investment by the standardization of investment incentive regimes in an omnibus incentives legislation and reforming the platform for implementing mechanism across the public and private sector. The problem with us is we are too learned. We need to do what we say we are going to do. That is what that really means. And it means that we need to standardize and bring clarity. If you're going to give somebody an incentive, they shouldn't need an interpreter to figure out what those incentives are. So I think that for sure the BHDA and the tourism partners would want to get involved in an exercise because we've seen the bitter end of incomplete and, 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 and poorly through implementation procedures. And we can't expect to, to, to attract foreign direct investment when Barbados seems like a maze of rules and regulations. Um, the, the other one, the productive sector reform focused on, on reducing the cost of doing business. And that's interesting that it comes in a budget that actually adds costs. <laughs> but we will have to talk about Absolutely. reducing the cost of doing business. And perhaps it is a recognition that this is a short term. The truth is you can live through short term pain in certain circumstances where you can see the light at the end of the tunnel. And when someone, and this is the strong recommendation, certainly that is something that we should do, if we are supposed to collect the taxes and close the deficit, tell us every single month how are we doing versus that objective. Tell us every single month we are sharing the pain. 10% increase is every single Barbadian sharing the pain. So let's really share the pain. Let us monitor and let us get a report how are we doing. We are in it for something. We are holding our bellies for a reason. And there is a light at the end of the tunnel because within a year we would have closed the deficit and it is only short term, but we, in the meantime, would be looking at how we can grow the economy. So I feel that that kind of dialogue, not only with the people in this room, but with every Barbadian, you taxed everybody, so let us all have an input. Semantics and words, very important. 
There's a bullet point that says instituting a competitiveness commission, an operational unit to drive implementation. So are we even scared to use the term implementation unit? From the time you say operational unit, that is like gyrating a crop over. Round and round and round you are going. It is not, it is not to me a constructive way to frame what is in fact going to be a paradigm shift for us. We have been in operational units for the last four or five years. What we need is an implementation unit that oversees these very, very bitter pills and looks to the future in terms of what growth can look like. No operational unit is going to do that. An implementation unit with targets and, and, and specific budgets and specific timelines. That, that, I think, would make us all feel more comfortable that the pain is not for naught. I have to touch on a favorite of mine, and I was so happy. I was so joyous to see government looking at VAT refund factoring program. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> I strongly believe, then and now, that there is a way for us to free up some activity in the private sector where the private sector can help itself. There must be a way with so much liquidity in the system that those of us strangled by the lack of VAT returns can get some relief somehow by making funds available at a time when we need them, when we need them to do refurbishments, when we need them to do things that will actually help the industry to grow and improve. So I do not know the details, and I do not know what is required, but I certainly will put my hand up to say, I want to be part of any effort looking seriously at constructive ways of getting VAT refunds in the hands of people who want to make business happen. And I don't know, from a, from a financial institution point of view, um, what is intended, but I do believe that through dialogue, all things can be solved. All things. And if there's a way for us to participate, I feel that we need to take it. Credit unions, banks, uh, the tourism sector, if there is a way for us, and, and all the sectors that are owed VAT, to figure this one out, I feel that the time is now for us to sit down and dialogue and see what is possible. It may not be perfect, but it will certainly help generate, I feel, some activity where we're seeing a pressure with increased costs. Well, we have some comments from the floor, but quick, quick interventions on this question of Plan B, I think. Um, Oliver. Oliver? No, I was just going to say, going back to the, Denise's question in terms of what the business community should do, I think, and again, supporting Charles's point, take advantage of the opportunity for a consultation with the government, but basically demand that we get a consultation quickly. Because as Vincent said, we're into the fiscal year already. Um, you know, we have a, a potential national event maybe 10 months from now. So I think the reality is that the sooner that we can get the consultation going and get the actual national restructuring program in place to benefit the economy. Okay, a quick uh, return to, because there's some other people who want to make a contribution. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I didn't address the, the budget um, and the national business sector directly when, when I spoke before. And I think I should because there's something you should take for granted. Uh, we're taking for granted, for example, that the 2% the commission on foreign exchange transactions will not affect the international business sector because our, the, 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 the companies operating in the international business sector uh, are operating out of foreign exchange accounts. Now, that uh, we, we've learned that over the years, sometimes what is written in the budget cannot be taken literally. When you get to the implementation, it's a different thing. Now, if in fact our assumption is not correct, then we have a problem because we are promoting Barbados as a place to do business of substance. That is going to be our competitive advantage, especially in this era of BEPS based erosion and profit shifting. Um, and if you're talking about business of substance, it means that you expect people to be doing real business out of Barbados with a lot of transactions and other kind of things. And if you're going to impose another, you may call it a levy call or commission call, where you like a tax of 2% on those transactions, you are making, you're going to shut down the international business sector. There's no question about that. Okay? Um, you notice that any discussion or all the provisions for the um, NSRL, National Social Responsibility Levy, 
there's no mention with national business and exemption. I think because there is um, in, in a notion that the international business sector doesn't have anything that will come into the port that you'll have to charge any national so But we do have some manufacturing um, um, international businesses, and in fact, if we, as we promote more Barbados as a place for doing business of substance, we might attract more businesses that are actually going to be affected, transfer, their, their business might be affected by the NSR. So these are matters that are of some concern to us, and which we'll be monitoring. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Just identify yourself. May Hines, May Hines Consulting Inc. And I speak specifically to the tourism, travel, and hospitality sectors. Um, we are talking here about implementation and monitoring. And before moving forward, there have been two key major initiatives that are sitting somewhere on someone's desk that will impact Barbados' competitiveness. And I talk about the tourism master plan, which I think the, the end year is almost with us. And I talk about something called a national tourism host program. And I'd like to ask the private sector to maybe get a status report from the relevant authorities on those two. Many dollars have been spent bringing in overseas consultants for tourism master plan. Um, I declare interest in one of those projects. But where are we? So could we maybe just look at implementation in, with regard to two major projects that will definitely affect the tourism sector positively. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jim Reed. I'm uh, from Caribbean LED Lighting. I represent the manufacturing sector on the council. Um, I can sum up feedback that you've requested from a manufacturer in three words. Concern, uncertainty, and disappointment. Concern for the first time that I can experience, and I'm getting on a bit now, that a government tries to dampen the economy. I've not experienced that before. And I would have thought that that's the, act, the exact reverse would be required. The uncertainty is that we're, we export 70% of what we manufacture, over 70%. We're a net foreign exchange owner. And I don't know how this 2% is going to work. And that creates a lot of uncertainty. But the biggest area of disappointment is the lost opportunity in renewable energy and energy efficiency. Energy efficiency is probably number one. In 2015, 55% of all new jobs in the US were in the energy efficiency and renewable energy sector. We are blessed with the sun and wind and smart people here. Gosh. And there's an opportunity where and the government only has really a small number of tools in their toolbox, one being taxation, to incentivize people to go energy efficient to save energy. Now, in Barbados, in 2015, we saved 12,000 barrels of oil with the LED lights we manufacture here and sold in Barbados. That's a big impact, and it's growing. So I guess there's more questions that we have than answers, but in terms of feedback, concern, uncertainty, and disappointment. I'll take some more questions and comments on the floor. I've seen you, Charles Tibbetts, after this comment. Hi, my name is Ayu Kola. Um, I want to introduce a different concept here. Uh, we talk about debt swap, and we talk about selling the uh, Barbados Hilton. But I would like uh, the folks to consider an asset swap, swapping assets for debt. So your national insurance needs some investment. So how about them swapping some of national insurance debt as opposed to restructuring it? And then there are other assets that national insurance might be able to get involved in. Uh, so. I'd like just to throw it out on your table and see if there's any interest in swapping debt for assets. Uh, in addition to that, there, any measure will certainly have an impact on business. We've seen quite a, a number of international businesses leave the territory. We have seen a tragic war. My concern here now is, are we going to see manufacturers move to different jurisdictions because now they have all this cost imposed on them. And some manufacturers can easily move. So I'm just throwing out those, um, those ideas uh, for discussion. Oh, the other thing is uh, for the economist, I, sorry to get your name. Uh, Mr. Moore. What about electric cars? What about duty-free concession on electric cars? 
I mean, that's directly would uh, assist uh, as it relates to all this uh, fuel cost. So those are just some, cons some, some thoughts I had I'd like to share with you. Can I Thank you. Quickly? Yes, uh, respond, Mr. Moore. So I have, to I, have to, I have to declare my interest. I actually do have an electric car. So I, I agree with you fully. And I'm not, not biased in this whatsoever. But we do have lower um, excise taxes on electric vehicles already, 20%, um, um, compared to the 100 and something percent on traditional um, fossil fuel vehicles. The problem, though, is that the, the value of the electric vehicle, when it lands on the port, is so high that when you apply that 20%, it still makes it more expensive. So what we actually need is um, some other way of incentivizing persons to purchase electric vehicles and hybrids. And the recommendation that I had earlier, which is to maybe uh, your, your um, road taxes um, should be based on CO2 emissions. Well, that should be a good way of transitioning persons from these very large 4x4s into very small vehicles uh, in, the, for, uh, in the initial term. So maybe if we drive a bit more Suzuki Swiss, um, that might be a nice way of transitioning and reaching off all fossil fuel use. Um, if we drive more hybrids, that might be a nice way. And if you also combine that with the lower duties, that definitely there's a, there's a great advantage. Um, and also with the renewable energies, um, the electric vehicles can also be used as a storage for uh, renewables during the day, and then you draw down, down on them during the night time as well. So there's tr tremendous opportunities of using more electric vehicles uh, in the island. So I think there's definitely a lot of advantages there. And uh, within the um, government sector as well, this is one of the things that I thought would be a nice way of transitioning and reducing costs. Electricity cost is a, a significant part of the government budget. And one of the things that um, Jamaica did in their structural adjustment reform is that they had targets for each government department, and those targets uh, for electricity use reduced every single year. So the government, it wasn't necessarily just using LEDs, but it was also just your consumption pattern. And then after you reach that point, uh, you can't push it anymore, then you start purchasing a bit more um, efficient uh, appliances, uh, LED lighting, and so on for the government department. But those sort of things, those sort of initiatives to me, um, show that you have a, a bold vision for the country because we always talk about the green economy but we always leave it out in these policy measures. And just as a, a side note, you mentioned um, that for asset swaps, this is something that St. Kitts has done already. Uh, it is something that um, other countries can consider doing within the Caribbean because all the Caribbean countries have this issue with very high levels of debt. Um, and the, the only thing is to sort of make sure it's encompassed within a structural adjustment program. Whenever you have um, anything that fiddles with your debt and is not within, say, an IMF um, structural adjustment program, it has significant impacts. It, it never really works. So you need to encompass the structural adjustment program and sort of fill them with your debt within an IMF program. If Thank you don't, you. then it can be problematic. Yeah. Uh, St. Kate's also, sorry, Ghana also had a debt for nature swap as well, where they, um, they told um, some European country, I think it was the Dutch, that they're going to maintain a particular uh, part of their forest area, and, and, and they gave them money for that, for maintaining that particular area. So you can also have debt for nature swaps as well. And we're also saving a, a hell of a lot of fossil fuels in Barbados as well. We can sell the fact that we're saving a lot of fossil fuels as an asset on the international market as well. So these type of things are, are, are very bold visions that would also fit within our green economy initiative as well. Donna Wellington and then a comment from the floor here. I just want to make a, a comment about the foreign exchange reserves. I, I did touch on this earlier, but it is still a, a significant uh, situation and an issue of concern. Um, what we are still facing this year, uh, apart from everything else is we have to pay for the debt that we have foreign uh, and that can be uh, according to him it was 280 something that's my number is more say 360 uh, and given where our reserves are today that's in a significant drop uh, and those those payments start um, in june significantly and then in december um, what is not clear to me at all, notwithstanding the dampening of foreign exchange, that is foreign exchange in the system. That is really not foreign exchange. That represents reserves. 
And with that drop, given the debt service we have to pay, I'm really not clear as to how we get back to a reasonable number. The, the, the minister did say that the internationally respected uh, level should be 12. We're not there. And I don't know how we get back there, even if magically a sale, well, one sale already has, has protracted for quite some time. Uh, and the other sale of, of even this property um, will take some time. This is not something that you, you're not selling buttons. Um, so a sale of this magnitude takes some time. Uh, and I don't know how that all happens and, we, and, and tops back up. And even if it were, it would, not, it would only be 100 million USD. It would not be enough to get our reserves back to where they're supposed to be. So I'm really not clear as to what is going to happen, but the trajectory for our reserves does not look good at this point, and that's a very critical issue for us. David, before they comment, I'd just like to make a point mm -hmm. um, regarding alternatives or plan Bs. My fear is that the last few years have been so perilous that I'm hoping that this doesn't drive more businesses underground. We've heard of several situations where businesses have gone underground and the parallel economy is growing. And what we need to do is have taxable income. And I would have thought the idea would have been eventually to lower the rate and broaden the base. And if you keep doing these ridges and mountains, more companies will look at alternative way of doing business. We're coming quickly to 1015 and therefore one com more, more comment from the floor. Then Charles Herbert and then wrap up. Just quickly, um, when I listened to the budget last night, I must tell you that bef even before the budget came, you have to accept this election there. So you, you very well much know that. After the excellent presentation, Charles and I had, had some discussion about what was being done in terms of the two groups. It was clear that you were setting the scene, but it's never going to be possible to get all the things happening knowing how politics works. So that's never going to happen. What I was actually hoping for, though, is that you have a situation where the situ it doesn't get worse. So the, I was pleased last night that nobody's going home. But at the same time, that has to come with I can in, 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 um, increments and so on all the time, which is cost, without productivity can't happen. So I thought what would have come out is certain things we're going to hold because we really can't afford anybody that's going home. But we can't afford that you're doing more than me and still we get the same 5%. It just can't work. It had to get in some form of incentive pay even if there's some adjustment with dialogue with the union. The next aspect of it then, again, was simple. You have to watch the matching principle where you're selling assets, which is typically, because we're in a debt situation, you understand you had to do it. Well, we gotta get away from this situation with a matching principle where you don't take long-term assets, which we did back when, when I was the chief operating officer of the telephone company and did, and sell the shares. You have to be very careful with that because the potential for the revenue generation from those things in the future will be gone. But unless you're actually tackling the deficit then and you know, the debt, debt service costs to the point where interest costs goes along, that then becomes ongoing income. But you don't have to pay that money up. So those kind of things, I'm hoping that through the committees that we've got, that we get to what I call a holding position, knowing very well that the next part, whoever forms the government, will then be doing these transformations. We're not going to get that within one year. I just want to point out, though, that the first wave of layoffs under this administration occurred in the private sector. And while you, pay, you say, well, nobody is going home, that's in terms of the public sector. Yeah. If the squeeze is strong enough in the private sector, there could be layoffs. But, but, I, but I, I, there's no question that. But the, the issue of this is that I believe that what we as a country, if we see we all this together, for the context of the presentation, nobody could argue with excellent last night. I thought what we would get is if we're all in this together, it means that this idea that you can't drop salaries, that's a referendum. You get the, the, all the units together to say, look, the situation that we demand means that we as a people want to make sure. I've, I've got $1,000 I'm paying wages of 10 people. I can only pay 800, I can send home two, or pay each one $80 okay. per week. And I thought a referendum saying, look, coming out of that, the private sector, the social partnership says, as a group, we can make some adjustment so people don't want. So okay, we got to wrap up. Charles Herbert. David, I want to say a, a brief comment on the national insurance. National insurance is simply somewhere we put our money until we take it back out. Money is not created. 
is not created and, and, and it doesn't disappear generally. But if we take $70 million a year of revenue away from national insurance and it, pays, it say, continues to pay the same benefits, then that $70 million needs to come from somewhere and it's only going to come from contributions. So this is not short term. But whatever we take away from national insurance is going to have to be Okay? So that $70 million is coming in contributions in the years to come. If we exchange national insurance debt for assets, these things can be good. Let us be sure that we choose the assets that national insurance gets. The problem is that national insurance is managed by the same people who will be choosing what assets they get. Okay? We wouldn't accept that if it were our debt being exchanged for assets. And the last thing I want to say to you all in here is get real. Okay? We know that this is a recessionary bu budget that is going to drop GDP. There's no question about it. We know that all of our staff are going to have a cost of living increase approaching 10%. They are going to expect that in wage increases the next way around. So even though those taxes are not directly on us, it is coming back to our cost of doing business. There's only a small delay. So let's get real and stop talking about all the good things that might happen or might not happen. We know exactly what is going to happen. Okay, so let's get real. We can, our economy cannot survive this budget that in fact will push us into a recession and will not raise the money that it is projected to raise. Let's get real and no less soft soap it. Thank you very much. A couple of points in summary. We have noted here that a combination of this increase in the NRSL and the 2% Commission on Foreign Exchange will dampen demand for imports and the outflow of foreign exchange, but is likely to increase inflation. Even the minister himself conceded that last night. He said short term, but everything depends upon what is his definition of short term and what is yours. Um, the minister painted a picture of a dire situation. There is a threat as he highlighted it with, the, with respect to the deficit. But we've had Charles Herbert here disagreeing with the measures that have been employed to deal with that. He thinks that we're going in the wrong direction and it's disastrous for the economy and it will depress economic activity. Mr. Moore saw some strengths and uh, uh, among these, he thought that um, debt reprofiling was useful. Um, the amnesty was, was another positive aspect of it. And uh, all Barbadians are effectively contributing to a cut in wages and salaries by the increase in the national social responsibility levy. Uh, he thought also that um, SOEs could benefit from the divestment uh, program uh, in the private sector, that is. And there were consulting opportunities. On the negative side, though, he didn't feel that um, the measures would correct the fiscal situation and that uh, they could make it even worse. Well, Donna Wellington, her definition was short-term pain for no long-term gain. And of some significance here, she was very positive on the whole question of the divestment of the Hilton. But like Roseanne Myers and others, they felt that there is a need for the average Barbadian to have a, a stake in this divestment program. And there was also a call for some transparency uh, as it relates to this. Concern too about the absence of details when it comes to the cuts in expenses. And a fear too that Overall, it wouldn't improve our competitiveness nor our confidence. As one person said, no real sense of a sustainable plan. Rosa Myers felt that while on the one hand, the government appeared to be seeking to protect the tourism sector by not changing the 7.5% uh, VAT rate, 
On the other hand, the, the costs would be added to this sector. A cost occasioned by the NRSL and the 2% commission on foreign exchange. And she felt that doing business in Barbados got a bit more complicated. There was a comment also coming from Oliver Jordan that he too agreed that Barbadians needed to have a stake in the divestment program. And we did touch on the very important uh, international business sector and concerns arising from how much uh, we have lost in taxation in that sector. And as Henry Holmes said, there really is a need for us to do more. We, he believes that you need to plow back more of some of what has been earned by this sector in promoting it and taking it to a new level. That, in, in summary, therefore, is what we have been able to gather as some of the key takeaways this morning. I want to thank you all very much. It's on. It's on. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Chamber, I'd like to invite Oliver Jordan, a council member, to do the vote of thanks. Thank you, President Eddy. On behalf of uh, our territory leader, Mike Baino, and other partners of PwC and staff, I want to say first thank you to the Chamber of Commerce for giving us the opportunity to partner with you again this year, uh, particularly this being a very important budget for, for the country. Um, I also particularly thank uh, Gloria Eduardo and the members of her tax team. Um, when I left the office last night at midnight, they were still working hard. <laughs> that are out first thing this morning. I want to also thank the fellow members of the, of the panel, in particular David, as usual, his stellar moderation. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you, panel. I just want to, I'm sure you would agree with what President Eddie said, is that uh, no, no one party or no public sector or private sector has any monopoly in terms of ideas. And I think the discussions such as this are important in terms of ensuring that we all get a chance to debate the various issues facing the country. And I'm sure we will look forward to further discussion. As I suggested, I think we need to advance the timetable for that discussion, because I think the longer we wait, the, the, the more detrimental impact it will be on the economy. So I definitely want to thank you all for coming out this morning and engaging with us. And I want to encourage both the Chamber and the Private Sector Association to continue to press government, to ensure that this continued and timely dialogue to ensure that the necessary measures are put into place, not just to deal with the immediate short-term issues, but to ensure that there's a, a medium and longer-term fix for the economy. So again, thank you all for coming out this morning, and on behalf of the Chamber of Commerce and PwC, thank you. Have a good day. <laughs>